Okay, everyone, welcome back to class. Good to see so many are still interested in this very information-rich uh, topic. Probably going to take us to the end of the school year to complete this course. And I'll just tell you that uh, tonight is lecture three. I've given you all a handout that covers the, the basic stuff that we covered in lectures one and two. And I want to just quickly go through it, and then we'll get on to some new stuff. And my plan is... Uh, to be done with the introductory stuff today, but that means we've got to fast track some stuff and, and it will be very information rich tonight. And then next week when we get together, we start in the Bible. And we're going to stay in the Bible until we're done. But I just feel this introductory material is so important. It's very important. So I just want to open with a word of prayer and then um, we're going to get to our study, okay? Let's, let's go to the Lord here. Our dear, blessed, holy God, we thank you, Lord, for your sacred word, the Bible, your self-disclosure in Scripture, and in the person of your beloved Son, Jesus, of whom the Bible speaks. He is the centerpiece of your holy Scriptures and the centerpiece of human and world history. And uh, Lord, we're so privileged that we've been called aside out of the world by you to form a special, blessed, new covenant priesthood. And uh, Lord, we need to be uh, knowledgeable, proficient in the Holy Scriptures, but we need your help. We need the Holy Spirit's help, uh, the very one who authored the Bible. And we pray that he would be here tonight with us so that uh, truth could be communicated, it could be understood, received, and then called upon in just the right way in the future uh, when we're in the world evangelizing, when we're called upon also to defend the faith and um, give a reason for the hope that's in us. So Lord, please be with us. I pray the class is enjoyable, it's helpful, it's honoring to God, and it's a blessing to your people. In Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. 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 Praise God. Okay, everyone, so I have handouts here. If anyone needs a handout, I see. Okay, so... Um, in our handouts, this is just the basic notes that cover what we looked at in lectures one and two. So I just want to quickly go through. You can follow along in your notes if you like. Uh, we started off by uh, pointing out that everyone has presuppositions. Everybody has ideas, uh, starting places in their thinking. They have beliefs that are foundational. And they're really immune to revision. And networks of such presuppositions form our paradigms and our worldviews. And these act as lenses through which we interpret and connect everything. And I pointed out that paradigmatic thinking uh, is applied to the Bible too. I think a lot of us have been taught by others what certain biblical words mean. And we just come to the Bible and we see those words and we've just got it in our heads that those words mean certain things. And in the course, we want to ask, that, ask the question, have we been taught right? Are these, is this paradigm that we're following correct? Is this what the biblical authors had in mind when they were writing? And it's, the thing is, it's very hard to disabuse ourselves of paradigmatic thinking. It's, it's very hard to come to the Bible with a clean slate and not bring presuppositions to the table. But we're going to ask God to help us get as close as we can to that. We want to draw from the Bible, not bring ideas to the Bible. And... No Christian thinks he's doing that. No Christian you talk to says, oh yes, I like to bring my own preconceived ideas to the Bible. No, we all think we're pulling from the text, but in fact, we're, to one degree or other, we're bringing things to it. And it's, um, it's important that we become epistemologically self-conscious in this. We know what we're doing. And um, then God can help us, okay? Um, we looked at a little bit of church history. We'll look at more tonight. Jesus began his church in A.D. 32, roughly. Uh, by the 5th century, 6th century, the thing has uh, become corrupted. It's become hijacked by something called the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church, with its distinctive doctrines and practices, has put itself, I think, outside the proper boundaries of what we could call authentic Christianity. But... Um, you had an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther in 1517. He challenged some of this. Remember, he, he nailed the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg uh, Castle door, and he began the Reformation. And um, 
Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and others became very influential in the Reformation, this Protestant movement away from Rome. And um, I mentioned before, Calvinism, or Reformed theology, uh, wherever it went, it brought learning and literacy, and the Calvinist community, or the Reformed community, has a very well-deserved reputation for academic excellence. That's true. And if you go to Bible school, you're probably going to, I can guarantee it, you're going to work from a textbook written by someone who had very heavy Calvinist leanings. And he's going to teach you. And you're going to hear words like elect, chosen, predestined, adopted, all these kinds of words. And they have certain meanings now attached to them. And we just think that those meanings are biblical. We're going to ask during the course whether they really are, okay? But uh, for Calvinism, now we have John Calvin, 1509 to 1564. Calvin's theology is uh, encapsulated in the TULIP, the acronym TULIP. Total depravity, man cannot even understand the gospel, let alone receive Jesus for salvation. He needs to be regenerated. God needs to do a miracle. Uh, God unconditionally elects people to salvation. It has nothing to do with us. Christ died only for the elect. His blood was not uh, shed for the non-elect. It will not be applied to the non-elect. It's not intended for the non-elect. God has to extend an irresistible grace. That is to say, God regenerates you. You're born again before you can exercise faith. So as Lorraine Botner would say, um, you have eternal life so that you can have faith. You don't have faith so that you can have eternal life. That's, that's Calvinistic doctrine, teaching. And then persevering of the saints, you, once you're, if you're elect, you can't be non-elect. Uh, God has chosen an eternity past whom he would save, uh, elect to salvation, and you can't get out of that one, okay? Um, we also looked at uh, Calvinistic, uh, the Calvinistic uh, view of human freedom, and there really is none. Really, in the last analysis, you either have a strong determinism where God unilaterally determines everything you do, everything you say, do, and think. Calvin talked like that. Um, we read uh, some uh, Gordon Clark who said man was worse than a puppet in the hands of a puppeteer. Remember that? Not all Calvinists think that way. Some are compatibilists. Some think um, that legit human free will is compatible with God's determinism. Uh, they would say you're free to do whatever you desire. So you are free. It is you uh, following your desires. It's just that your desires are strongly determined by your character, um, your nature, your memories, your experience, and so on and so forth. And it turns out in the last analysis that God determines all that stuff. So compatibilism collapses down back into determinism. And that's a, a, Calvin, that's a Calvinistic conception of uh, God's sovereignty and, and human self-determination there. Uh, a competing view that's still Reformation, this is still Reformed theology, Reformed theology is not limited to Calvinism. Reformed theology includes Arminianism, Jacobus Arminius. And uh, Arminius from 1560 to 1609, he agreed with John Calvin that man is totally depraved. Every part of man is touched by sin. There's no way on earth man would ever freely choose Jesus for salvation. But uh, Arminius taught that uh, man does have a free will, he can respond affirmatively just because God has freed the wills of all people. So it's not free will as much as it is freed will. And he called that a, a prevenient, prevenient <laughs> grace, a kind of prevenient grace where God frees the wills of all people. Uh, so he agrees with total depravity. It's just that God has stepped in and helped man, opened man's eyes. Uh, he didn't believe in unconditional election to salvation. He believed in election, um, conditional election to salvation, where God infallibly knows uh, from all eternity who would freely receive him on faith, and then God considers that person elect. And, uh, of course, he needs, he needs God's help. Um, and we, I think we talked about that. That doesn't limit God's sovereignty, by the way. God could have elected people who didn't want to be saved. So on, on the Arminian conception, uh, God is still sovereign. God just decided to, ch he chose the people who wanted to be saved. And he could have done otherwise, but as a matter of fact, that's what he chose to do. 
Uh, Arminius taught unlimited atonement. So Jesus died for the sins of the world. He provided salvation for everyone. But it doesn't do you a bit of good unless you appropriate the saving benefits of what Jesus did by faith. That's uh, Arminius. Uh, irresistible grace on the Calvinist conception. God regenerates you before you can believe. He regenerates you in order that you can believe. Uh, Arminius taught, no, um, you can resist God's grace. Uh, God gives you prevenient grace so that your eyes are opened and you can respond affirmatively to the truth. But if you don't want to respond affirmatively, that's you. you. You have the power to do that. And so that's his view on that. And then perseverance of the saints. Well, on the Calvinist conception, if you're elect, you're elect. You're going to heaven. You're predetermined to go to heaven. You, can't, you cannot forfeit your salvation. Jacobus Arminius was agnostic on the issue. He wasn't sure if you could forfeit your faith. Uh, whereas the modern Arminian is pretty certain you can. You can forfeit your salvation. You can walk away. You can apostatize. And they have verse passages that they would go to. They would go to places like Hebrews uh, chapter 6 or Hebrews 10. There are passages there that kind of sound like a real warning against apostatizing. So those are the two views. Now, it's, it's amazing to me that um, if, uh, if I'm not a Calvinist, so many, so many in the Calvinist camp immediately call you Arminian. Well, you're Arminian then. Like, there's only two options here. And if you're, if you're um, not an Arminian, well, then you're Calvinist. <laughs> and we need to understand something. You know, I teach world religions. I've been teaching world religions at college since 2009. Okay, so a long time. You have the textbook, the textbook variety of these world religions... But then you have an infinite variety of folk versions of those things, too. So you have pure Calvinism, but then you have all kinds of shades of Calvinism out there. And you have pure Arminianism and all kinds of shades of Arminianism. And it's just not as simple as being Calvinist or Arminian. It's just not that simple at all. Um, but I would like to introduce to you t uh, today um, a third Reformation, and I would say at least quasi-Reformation. I guess it's not... Um, you wouldn't call it a Reformation proper theology, but it's right on the line there because this theology comes from Louis de Molina, who was a Jesuit, by the way. So Molina, uh, he died in 1600. And so he agrees with some things Calvin says, and he agrees with some things that Arminius said. And he's, you know, we like to see him down the middle, which I think, I really think he's, kind of closer to the Calvin side, but whatever, you can decide on that. Um, but our, uh, Molina thought, you know, no one, this, he's getting this from the Bible, and he's getting this from human experience. He said, no one is so bad that they would reject God's offer to save them in all circumstances. Like, it doesn't matter what you show these people, they're never going to receive Jesus. Molina thought, in the right circumstances, anyone would receive Jesus for salvation. But on the other hand, he observed that no one is so good that they would receive, or yet they would receive Jesus in all circumstances. So I'm not sure if I said that right. On the one hand, he said no one's so bad that they would reject Christ no matter what happens, and no one's so good that they would receive Christ no matter what happens. So he kind of agreed with um, Arminius in uh, a prevenient grace. He said, it must be the case, based on Scripture, that God has enabled people everywhere to respond affirmatively to the truth. He believed that. Uh, and then he taught, well, I'm going to flip this board around here. Well, maybe at first I'll just say this. He was an unconditional election guy. I'll, I'll just say that. Louis de Molina believed that God could have saved anyone he wanted to. He could have saved the world. He, just like Calvin, uh, Molina is, a, is a strong on this. God could have actualized just the right circumstances to save anybody or everybody. But as a matter of fact, he only elected a few, the ones he's chosen for his own purposes, right? So um, he believes in prevenient grace, but he also believes in unconditional election, he believes that Jesus died for the world and that God assumes a saving posture to the world somehow, some way. 
But he also believes in faith before regeneration. So Calvin teaches that man needs to be regenerated. God has to zap them, regenerate them, give them a new heart so that they can believe. It's eternal life first and then belief. Um, Arminius didn't believe it, and Molina didn't believe that. But Molina does believe in eternal security. So you do see a blend there between the two guys, okay? Now, I'm going to flip my board over, and we're going to look at Molina's unique... He's got a unique uh, way to, to look at God's sovereignty and human freedom. Remember, the libertarian free will theologian says that man really does exercise free choice. Uh, God is not strongly determining man's choices. Man is making real choices. Uh, man could do otherwise. That's the point. You could do differently than you've chosen to do, right? On the Calvinist conception, it looks like man couldn't do other than he does. Arminius disagrees, and Molina disagrees. Molina thinks that man really is free. So how does this work? How does God's sovereignty and human freedom work together? Well, this is an ingenious uh, philosophy, and I think that um, I kind of align myself a bit with Molina on some of this, at least. Molina wants us to know that God is really, in the truest sense of the word, omniscient. Now, on the Calvinist conception, and I've read lots of Calvinist works, God only infallibly knows the future because he's determined or decreed to make that future happen. So God's foreknowledge is based on his self-determination, on the Calvinist conception. That's very clearly written, articulated in their works. Molina thinks God's omniscience is not determined on God's omnipotence or self-determination. There's more than raw determination here. For Molina, God just knows. And don't ask us how he knows, he just does. It's just a mysterious omniscience. He knows flawlessly, seamlessly, everything that ever could be known. All truth, God, he comprehends it, okay? And uh, so Molina says God has uh, included in his omniscience something he called natural knowledge. Molina says God knows uh, intimately and infinitely all the worlds he could have created. Uh, everything there is to know about those possible worlds, God knows all about it, Okay? But then God determined he was going to make this world and not some other world. And once he decided to do that and he made the world, we say that God has free knowledge. That's knowledge of the actual world. So you understand the difference here. Natural knowledge is the knowledge of any world he might have created. He knows those worlds exhaustively, even though he will never actualize them. But he knows about them. But then he makes our actual world, and it's this one. And he knows absolutely everything there is to know about it. Okay? Now Molina goes a step further. And he says, God not only knows the worlds he could have made, and he knows the world he did make, but God has a kind of middle knowledge, or what we call counterfactual knowledge of creaturely freedom. That's a mouthful. <laughs> counterfactual knowledge of creaturely freedom. What's that? That's the knowledge God has of what you would do if the circumstances were different. What you would do. So Molina's got some verse passages. Let's go, please, in our Bibles to um, Matthew 11. Can you find Matthew 11? Matthew chapter 11. You'll see this. Middle knowledge. What people would have done if things were different. Okay, Matthew chapter 11, and I'm going to put in at verse 21, this is the Lord now, he's upbraiding some of these non-believing cities. Matthew eleven twenty-one: 21, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. 
But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for that land, uh, for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And so Jesus knows what would have happened in these places had the situation been different, if, if God would have actualized a different set of circumstances. And uh, Paul talks about this too. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2. This is what Paul says here. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. Paul says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So once again, people would have behaved differently had their circumstances, situation been different. And the Bible has... A few instances, you see um, in uh, 1 Samuel 23, for example, uh, there's uh, David on the run from King Saul. He stops in a place called Kela, and uh, word is uh, given to Saul that David's there in Kela. So David consults the Lord, 1 Samuel 23. Lord, will the men of Kela surrender me to Saul? Yes, they will, David. So David got out of there, and... Uh, his life was spared, and, and Saul cut off the expedition to go, get, to go get David. But the point is, God knew what the men of Kela would have done. If David had remained there, they would have surrendered him over to these people. So, Molina wants us to know that God knows infallibly what people would do in any given set of circumstances. And so the next step is God chooses to actualize those circumstances in which people would freely receive Jesus for salvation. So in that sense, man is making a free choice. He's doing what he wants to do. And yet God is sovereign behind the whole thing. And that's, that's Molina's way of reconciling God's absolute sovereignty and human free will and responsibility. Um, it's not, it's not certain that man will choose to do what he does. Man could do otherwise, it's just that he doesn't. And God knows infallibly that he won't. Man's not just a mechanism, he's not a puppet. He's freely doing what he wants to do on Molina's view. So, like John Calvin, this is unconditional election. Uh, Molina would turn to Matthew 11, he would say, look, uh, God could have saved those guys in those cities. He could have done uh, what he did in these other cities and they would have repented, but God didn't want to save those people. So it's unconditional election to salvation. And Molina wants us to know for sure that his middle knowledge has nothing to do with the world that he decided to actualize. It's man is not dictating to God at all. Molina sounds very much like Calvin here. Uh, it's, God is not electing people to salvation because he knows some stuff about those people. He's just freely choosing to save who he wants. Um, unlike Calvin, man's freedom does not mitigate God's sovereignty. So many Calvinist writers, they would say that if, if man exercises real libertarian free will, then God can't be sovereign. He cannot be maximally sovereign. And uh, Molina and others and the early church fathers would say that's not true. The more freedom you give man, the more man has uh, self-determination, and the greater measure of self-determination you give man, the, the greater God is, because God is still sovereign over that guy. That's how the early church saw it, and that's how Molina saw it. Um, unlike Calvin, again, faith precedes regeneration. Uh, God actualizes those circumstances in which man freely chooses uh, to receive Jesus on faith, and then the man is regenerated. And God's knowledge is not based on his raw determination. That's what, that is a real difference between Molina and Calvin, and, Cal, and modern Calvinists, where they say, God only knows the future infallibly because he's determined to make it happen. Molina says, God just knows the future. Uh, he knows what man's free choices are going to be, but he is not manipulating man like a puppet. Man is freely making um, those choices. Now, there are two objections to um, 
to Molina, I just want to quickly look at. One is, how can God possibly know the free choices of people that he'll never actualize? Remember, uh, God has natural knowledge of any world he might want to make. And that includes uh, full knowledge of what people, potential people in, that, in those worlds would do in any given set of circumstances. And, and some Calvinist thinkers say, well, that's, that's ridiculous. There's nothing to know. <laughs> if I know there's a red car in the parking lot, it's because there's a red car in the parking lot. There's this correspondence going on here, right? There's a, there's a grounding objection here being advanced against uh, Molinism. There's got to be something to know. But Molina, he anticipated this, and he said, look, every human being, every, every human essence, potential or actual, ultimately is the product of God's divine imagination. And God knows his imagination infinitely and seamlessly, flawlessly. Uh, and that includes knowing what each essence would do, what each individual human essence would do in any given set of circumstances. He just says, it's in God, and, um, and that's mysterious. We don't know really the mind of God, the depth of the mind of God. How could you? So if you go to Psalm 139, there the writer talks about um, God's knowledge. Let's just go to there, please. One, Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And I, I wrote a paper where I talked about some of these things in my graduate work. So I looked, I checked out the Hebrew on some of this. And um, Okay. 139. And I'll just read from verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Uh, so Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28 says that God's understanding is unsearchable. God's understanding is unsearchable. The writer here of the psalm, when he says such knowledge is too wonderful for me, what he's trying to say is God knows certain things and we don't have a clue how he can know them. And I think that we've hit the limits here. Obviously, God has middle knowledge, but how does he have that knowledge? He just has it. Uh, and to me, it's not any more or less mysterious than trying to understand how God made a universe from nothing. He didn't make it from his body. He didn't make it from himself. He fashioned a space-time matter universe from nothing. So if he knows things that have not yet become actual or never will become actual, he just knows. And that's how I think a Molinist would, would argue this. Um, A major issue between the Calvinist and the Molinist is when logically do we put the middle knowledge? So for Calvin, God has the middle knowledge logically after his decree to create a world. But Molina says no. Molina says no, God's got this knowledge before he decides to make anything. Logically, right? We're talking, this is all timeless stuff. This is hair splitting, this is really his splitting theological hairs here, aren't we? Well, wouldn't that sort of indicate that God can learn that? Is, I mean, is, right? If you take a position that God is going to not have middle knowledge until after, as you were saying, right? Then, 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 then you say, it, it, it yeah. sounds like, well, now God can learn. I think no Calvinist would affirm that. <laughs> but it, it, you do gesture in that direction, though, I think. I do see that a little bit myself. But all this is supposed to be timeless anyhow. We're talking about things that are logically prior or, or, um, or come logically following the, the, uh, the creative decree. The thing I want to point out here, and this is all very fascinating, and I have a whole biography here on, on Molina, and you can look at that yourself. The thing here is, all these guys, uh, Luther, Calvin, Arminius, Molina, and all their devotees, they're all defining terms the same way, <laughs> okay? Elected, election, chosen, predestined, predestinated, ordained, adopted. They all got the same definitions for these words. 
And so they're crafting systems, paradigms, um, around the definitions of those words. And I'm wondering if we shouldn't just take a step back and, and have another look at this, because maybe they, they're not defining these words properly. And what we want to do now is, um, because, by the way, this has supersaturated the Christian world. Supersaturated the Christian world. So what I wanted to do for the next, uh, for the remainder of the, cor- of the class, not the remainder of the course, but the remainder of the class, I want to talk to us about some very, very powerful, in- widespread, influential streams of religious and philosophical thought that were in the world before the time of Christ, during and after the time of Christ, and how I think some of this has come into the church via Calvinism, via reform, not just Calvinism, but all these guys. I think some of this has come in, and I think it's artificial. I think it doesn't, it's not biblical. That's what I'm going to try to argue here. I'm just telegraphing where we're going with this, okay? Uh, So if you're interested in this, by the way, if you're interested... I have uh, Norm Geisler's book, Chosen But Free, where he talks about some of this. Lorraine Butner's book, uh, Reformed Doctrine of Predestination. He is a Calvinist, but he will, um, he affirms some of what I'm going to say. And this book here by Dr. Ken Wilson, this is called The Foundation of Augustinian Calvinism. This is the abridged version of his PhD dissertation. It's a like hundreds of pages long, it costs you 200 bucks if you want the dissertation, but he got his PhD studying this, uh, reading all the church fathers up until the 5th century, and uh, seeing who was influenced by what, and how these things are connected, and he got his PhD through Oxford University, and, um, and I've, I've studied the church fathers myself, and, and I think he's barking up the right tree, but I don't think any of this is that controversial, but I do want to share it with you, and, um, and this will set the backdrop to when, when we go into the Bible next week and we stay in the Bible for the remainder of the course. But I think this is important. So the first a big school of thought here would be Stoicism. And uh, this is Zeno. Zeno is the uh, founder or the originator of the movement. He lived from 344 to 262 BC, Zeno. And this is, this is fatalistic, it's strongly deterministic, pantheistic. Uh, the universe is sort of like a Hindu, it's sort of like uh, Hinduism. By the way, there's nothing new religiously, you guys, there is absolutely nothing new. The Hindus were thinking like this too. All is one, God is the universe, all is one. Uh, all, oneness is ultimate and so is change and progress, process, an unfolding of potential. That is... That is absolutely ultimate, but it's hard to get a handle on this, and so sometimes it takes on a polytheistic expression, where it looks like there are many gods, but uh, what we need to know about Stoicism is that every event is controlled by fate. It's fatalistic, and um, every event in the universe, apparently, fated by the gods. Now, that's, that's a strong determinism. And, of course, there are shades of doctrine within Stoicism. And some are strictly pantheistic, and there's no polytheistic appearance, but some are polytheistic. But, but it is, um, there's a divine, unilateral predetermination of what's going to become of us. That's important. The second view is Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism. You've heard of Platonism. How about Neoplatonism? This is created by Plotinus who lived from 204 to 270 A.D. And so Plotinus believes in an ultimate reality he calls the One. By the way, so the, the Stoics believe in something called Logos. Logos is the rational principle that governs everything that happens in the universe, but it's a non-personal thing. The Apostle John says Logos is personal. Mind, will, and emotions, but... Stoicism's got logos as the somehow rational principle that determines everything. But uh, so Neoplatonism's third century Neoplatonism, Plotinus believes you've got this eternal, divine, heavenly realm, non material, where resides the one, the ultimate reality, the, sort of like the good. And um, from the one comes a series of emanations. 
until you get down to the material world, each less perfect, until you get to the material world. But the one, this ultimate reality, has to divinely infuse enlightenment into people. He, this one, whatever it is, has to uh, unconditionally elect people. I guess that would be the way to put it. Because our souls are bound in wickedness. And there's nothing you can do. You, it sounds like Calvin. It's like you're, you're bound. You're helpless. You're, um, you're passive. There's nothing you can do to help your situation. So there has to be this divine infusion. The all soul or the one has to give the gift of love to individual souls unconditionally. Um, this all soul, again, strongly determines everything that you do, even our, even our evil choices. Now, we heard that from Calvin, didn't we? We heard that from Gordon Clark also. Uh, nevertheless, the all soul or the one remains good, even though this entity somehow or this whatever you want to call it is determining evil actions in the world, um, it remains untouched by evil somehow, some way. It's kind of hard to understand. But we're told that even a screaming soul in Hades is good. It, that screaming soul was put there by the one, and it's good that that soul is there because that soul is playing its part. It's like a divine play that's being uh, acted out here. This is like Hinduism. In Hinduism, it's called Leela, the divine play. And everyone just does their part. If you, if you ever study Hinduism, you'll read the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, Arjuna is the archer going into battle, and he doesn't want to go into battle. He doesn't want to kill his family. He's got cousins over there. And guess who shows up as the chariot driver? It's Krishna, an avatar of ultimate reality. And Krishna says, just play your part, Arjuna. Kill people. It's okay, because really all is one and all is good. And you're not really killing these people. They just get absorbed into ultimate reality anyhow. So just do, do your part. Sort of check out a reality. Don't worry about it. Just do what you got to do. And it sounds very Hindu-like, I think, this uh, Neoplatonism. Uh, the third is called Gnosticism. This is Gnosticism. Gnostic means knowledge. And um, Gnosticism is this view. Again, it's very Hindu-like. We're all kind of walking around in a stupor. We don't understand what we really are. There's some divine spark in us, but we're like kings who have fallen into amnesia. We don't realize who we really are. And uh, we need help. We need, we need God or ultimate reality to enlighten us to what we really are. We need the secret knowledge. But it's only given to the unconditionally elect. Sounds very much um, like Calvin. A predetermined elect group will receive the gift and they must be kind of regenerated. They have to experience a, a regeneration so that they can receive salvation. And, um, and then the last one we're, we'll talk about here is Manichaeism. Manichaeism. And Manny, his name was Manny, who started the cult, lived from 216 to 274 AD. Uh, and he said, uh, there's this dualist battle going on between the forces of light and darkness. And he said, the good world is spiritual and the bad world is material. You have a good world of non-material and it's light and a bad world of material, that's darkness. That's, that's Gnosticism, that's classic Gnosticism there. Uh, and he says that uh, God, God in the light, unilaterally predetermined before birth who would receive light, who would be elected uh, to salvation and who would be damned, who would be left in darkness. Uh, he said the first man, primeval man, we call him Adam. This, is, this corresponds to Adam. Primeval man used his free will to abandon his abode in the light. And he descended into darkness and into matter. And so on Manny's view, man is walking around spiritually dead. Dead in sins and trespasses, you might say. And um, he has no free will. And he needs God to enlighten him. He needs to be enlightened to this, uh, a spiritual infusion. And so these are, these are main currents of thought in the world uh, in the days of the early church. Okay? Now, into all this comes Augustine. Who's ever heard of St. Augustine before? 
or Augustine. You hear him Augustine sometimes. Okay, St. Augustine. What's going on with him? Augustine was one of the biggest guns in the church, in church history. I've read it. I've read City of God three times. I like that book. I don't agree with everything in it, but I like that book. Augustine was trained in Stoicism. He, he said he was converted to Christianity through Neoplatonism. And then he spent 10 years in the Manichaean cult. 10 years, a decade, in that cult. He converted to Christianity, and then he taught for like 25 years or so. He taught um, what the early church all taught. He, he, he was right in line with what everyone was teaching. Okay, And this was... Um, Ken Wilson's PhD dissertation. He read everything the early church fathers wrote, 12 hours a day reading. And he categorized everything they had to say on the issue of free will and God's sovereignty. 84 authors, he read every word. Over 50, I think 53 of them addressed the topic specifically. And he said what he saw there until the year eight, uh, 412 A.D., what he saw there was complete unanimity, unanimous agreement. There is no disagreement between these guys. And here's what they taught. And if you're a note taker, I'll just give you what they taught here. Okay. Number one, the early church taught that God forces no one to convert. And by the way, again, this is not controversial. I've read the church fathers. I've noticed that myself. Norm Geisler's noticed that. John Frame, who's a five-point Calvinist, Calvinist, noticed that also. Lorraine Botner, he's noticed that also. Um, this is not controversial. So number one, God forces no one to convert. Number two, original sin damaged man for sure. When Adam sinned, we were damaged. But in some way, even though we're drawn to sin, we do retain our free will and we can respond affirmatively to God's uh, offer to save us. The early church was unanimous on this teaching. Uh, number three, they believed in election to salvation, but it was a conditional election. Uh, it was based on God's foreknowledge of who would freely receive his offer. So again, they're looking at passages like 1 Peter 1-2, where it, it calls uh, believers elect according to foreknowledge. And just like Molina, the early church until AD 412, just like Molina and Arminius, God's foreknowledge is not causative. This is really important. They made a big point of this. God infallibly knows everything there is to know, including your future free choices, but the fact that he knows what you're going to do does nothing to make you do it. That's really important. It's an important distinction here. Just because, if, I, if I know that you're going to eat a cookie tomorrow at 10 o'clock, no, that knowledge that I have, you're going to eat that cookie, does nothing to force you to eat it right? You could do different. It's just that I would know that you're going to do different. <laughs> See? But, I, but, the, but logically, it's the, it's the fact that's making the knowledge, not the knowledge making the fact. Okay? It, there's nothing causative about God's knowing something. That, that was really big. The church was big on that. Number four, God loves the world and Jesus died for everyone. The church was unanimous on that. And in fact, um, maybe you've heard of the church father Irenaeus. He was the bishop in Lyons. And Irenaeus was a hearer of Polycarp, who himself was a disciple of John the Apostle. Irenaeus wrote, he was the first kingdom of the cults guy. Irenaeus studied all the mainstream Gnostic cults. He wrote exhaustively on what they taught. I've, I have plowed through that myself. I've read that. It takes a lot of endurance. But he knew what they taught. And Irenaeus was big on this, that the more freedom man retains, the bigger God is. Make man as free as you want to make him. God is still greater than man and still sovereign over man. You don't need to shrivel man down to a passive puppet or something for God to be sovereign. You don't need to do that. Man can retain his freedom. What was the number four again? Just God loves, uh, God loves the world and Christ died for everyone. Okay. So, um, yeah, the church fought the Gnostics also on the issue of uh, man being spiritually dead. 
So the Gnostics say you're spiritually dead. There's nothing you can do. You're, you're like a corpse. There's no way you can respond affirmatively uh, to God's revelation. God has to grant you some sort of divine infusion. The church uh, fought the Gnostics on that. They said that's not true. That's not how this works. Now, Augustine, or Augustine, he comes along. After his conversion, he taught all that stuff I just shared with you. He was just like the rest of of the church uh, fathers, 25 years he taught those doctrines. But something very significant happened to Augustine. He began to debate a man named, anyone know it? Pelagius. The debates with Pelagius. Oh, you cheated. It's there. (laughs) Who's Pelagius? Who wants to offer a suggestion? Who's Pelagius? Pelagius is a heretic. (laughs) Okay, Pelagius, I believe he's a British monk who denied original sin. Uh, For Pelagius, when Adam sinned, he only harmed himself. Uh, His sin did nothing to uh, corrupt our nature. Um, He denied a fall that, that plunged humanity on a trajectory for hell. Each man's sin, said Pelagius, is his own, including Adam's. He said that the human race was not cursed. It was not infected with a sin nature. Adam was just a bad example. Uh, Pelagius taught that man was essentially good. Yeah. He, actually, he actually believed, too, that salvation can be reached without God's grace. Right. Pelagianism. Totally a heretic. <laughs> so he said, man is, a man is born essentially good. And man, this is my next point there, uh, Paul. Man is capable of doing what is necessary for salvation. He's got it in himself. He can do it. And um, the reason why man sins is because he follows bad examples, but Christ came to set a good example, okay? Now, there is no doubt this guy's a heretic. I mean, this is, what he's saying is not true, right? But when he started debating Augustine, and he starts talking about free will and human responsibility, Augustine reacted. And he went as far from Pelagius as he could... And he went straight back to his monachianism. He went straight back into some of this divine unilateral predetermination stuff. And I want to show you how this kind of happened here. So, for example, Pelagius is is asking about the efficacy of baptism. What's with baptism? Augustine believes, like everyone, that infant baptism is necessary for salvation. You need to be water baptized, so they're baptizing babies, right? Augustine believes that. But uh, he points out, you know, some babies, you have a, you have a, a baby of a, of a good Christian family, and the baby gets sick, and they're rushing to the bishop to baptize the baby, and the baby dies. Oh, no, baby's lost, going to hell. Meanwhile, you've got the baby of some prostitute who gets abandoned in the street... And good Christian parents take that baby and get the baby baptized. And Augustine points out, the babies have nothing to do with this. It has to be that God has predetermined who he's going to save. God is behind all of it. God is back of all of this. Since the babies have inherited guilt from Adam, mind you, right? He's, He's going back into this. So what Augustine is doing is a little something called, and you can write this down, It's theology based on heretical inversion. You're going to need to listen to all this again, aren't you? (laughs) It's going on my YouTube channel. This is something we should never, ever do, dear friends. My brothers and sisters, don't do this. Theology based on heretical inversion. This is where you get confronted with something that's not true biblically, and you react to it. In fact, you overreact to it. And philosophically, religiously, you go as far as you can and you begin building a theology as far as you can from the heresy that you were confronted with. And in a weird way, the heretics are determining what you believe now. So as an example, pantheism, God is the universe, okay? Well, that's a heresy. If you go too far away from pantheism, you deny God's actual presence in your life. Right? That's what happens. You, if you deny pantheism to the most outer extreme you can go. Or polytheism. If you overreact to the idea that, there are, that there's a multiplicity of gods, if you overreact, you're going to end up denying the Trinity. 
Now, the Trinity, we don't affirm three gods, we affirm three persons and one God. But even so, if you overreact to this idea of there being divine persons, you might end up denying um, the Trinity. How about antinomianism, um, um, lawlessness? People want to promote lawlessness. You say, well, no, I'm not, I'm not going to promote lawlessness. So if you go too far away from that, you end up being a legalist, right? You're legalistic. How about secular humanism? Man is the measure of all things. Man is autonomous. If you go too far, <coughs> you end up in, with panentheism, <laughs> where the universe, including man, just becomes God's body. And God's, God's will is the only actual will in the universe. So we're, we're confronting heresy by running away as far as we can and making more heresy. And this is what Augustine actually did. Augustine defined omnipotence like this. He said, God gets whatever he wants. And since not everyone is saved, I guess God doesn't want everyone saved. Now that's, that's him thinking. That, that's his human reason. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. We will have to look at that together. But we'll have to define omnipotence the way the Bible defines that. Uh, he says Christ only died for his um, elect. Well, that comes later, dying for the elect. That's later Calvinism. But uh, you can see, definitely see a progression in Augustine's thinking here. Okay? He goes from teaching everything that the early church has been teaching since the beginning to clearly he's reacting to Pelagius and he's lapsing back into some of this Gnostic thinking. That's very clear. Now, the tragedy here is, I think it's a tragedy. Maybe it's not. We'll search the scriptures and we'll discover the truth. But Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. And he, I mean, he shared Augustine's views. Uh, he accepted the Stoic views of sovereignty. He accepted the, the Manachian view of man's inability. For Augustine, faith itself was a work. So, uh, God has to give you faith like a gift. Is that what the Bible teaches? We're going to look at that in detail, what faith is and what it isn't. Calvin himself, very influenced by Stoicism. He wrote his first book at the age of 24 on the topic. He held the Stoic view of God's sovereignty, that God unilaterally predetermines every last thing that's going on here. In fact, his successor, and I'm quoting from Theodore Beza, who was Calvin's successor in Geneva, he says, Seneca, the Stoic, was a great favorite for Calvin because he was obviously in accord with Calvin, philosophically. Calvin was drawn to Augustine through a common Stoic commitment to a God who micromanages every last thing in the universe. And that fit his philosophy. And I'm reading from Calvin now. I'm going to quote you, John Calvin. Calvin says, Augustine is so holy within me that I could write my entire theology out of his writings. In fact, Calvin is going to quote Augustine 4,119 times. And I'm reading now from uh, R.C. Sproul. This is Sproul. He says, it has been said that all of Western theology is a footnote to the work of Augustine. This is because no other writer with the exception of the biblical authors has had more influence on Christendom. When Martin Luther and John Calvin were accused of teaching a new doctrine, they pointed to Augustine as an example of one who had taught the things they were teaching. And uh, I'm not going to read this a lengthy quote on page 165 here, Lorraine Botner's book, but uh, he says, the early church knew nothing about Calvinism or the Calvinist view of predestination and election, that, that came into the church via Augustine. And of course, he affirms that. He thinks Augustine was a genius. But um, he, it is innovation. Like, it looks like innovation uh, to me. So the challenge for us now, okay, we know all this. Now we got some background. The challenge for you and I, beginning next week, is to go into the Bible and read it for the first time. That's going to be hard to do. <laughs> We've all been Calvinized to one extent or other. We have, big time. <laughs> but I think God will help us. If we, we really want to know what he's telling us in his book, he won't abandon us. He's our good shepherd, right? He, uh, he wants us to be diligent students of the scriptures, rightly dividing the word of truth, 
so that we don't need to be ashamed. He says he wants that for us. We have to come into this thing with at least this pre-commitment. That God's will for us can be discerned by reading his word. If we don't have that pre-commitment, there's really no point in reading the Bible. (laughs) Right? Okay? So uh, that puts us at 55 minutes. And I said these lectures are going to be an hour long. So any thoughts, questions, or comments, or concerns before we wrap it up in prayer? What was number five on that? Uh, which one? Well, one, uh, you had number one, two, three, four, five for... God loves the world, and Jesus died for everyone. That's number four there, for the unanimous agreement, right? God loves the world, and Christ died for everyone. Yeah. And the fifth one was what? I didn't have a fifth one. Oh, I thought you did. No. You said something that says everybody's spiritually dead. Yeah, well, the, five, the, the four points that I gave you had to do with the unanimous agreement in the early church. God forces no one to convert. Original man damaged us, but we can still respond to the gospel. Election is based on God's foreknowledge. And number four, God loves the world and Christ died for everyone. That's unanimous agreement until AD 412. Thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Um, if you flip, uh, flip it around again. Sure. Um, you've got uh, right at the beginning, it says no free will and then freed will. Yeah. Now, what do you mean by freed will? Like you're set free? Yeah, so on the Calvinist conception, a fallen man, um, unsaved man, has no free will of his own at all. And he especially can't, cannot respond affirmatively to God's truth. He's, he's locked in that condition. Arminius taught that man really has a sin nature and he's in big trouble, but God offers a prevenient grace in which he frees man's will. So even though he's still not saved, his will has been freed by God so that he can respond uh, to God's truth. How can can they get away with saying there's no free will when Adam sinned? Well, there's an intramural debate going on amongst Calvinists because some Calvinists say that original man did have free will prior to the fall. But um, John Piper says at no time did man ever have free will, not even before the fall. So there's a little intramural debate there amongst Calvinists on that one. But I don't know. I'm just sharing with you what I've read. <laughs> just to get some background here, right? So. <laughs> yeah, Dennis. Somebody has made a statement, and I don't know if it's correct, but he says the safe road is between two ditches. One ditch is presumption, and one ditch is despair. Well, that's deep. <laughs> I need to think about that one. Hey, Garish. Hey, uh, so I was kind of confused by that natural free and middle knowledge. Yeah. So natural knowledge, that's the potential knowledge of potentials. Free knowledge is the actual, and the middle knowledge is like actual with additional potential knowledge. Because it's both of them, right? Yeah. Um, for Molina, <coughs> The middle knowledge extends to potential worlds that God could have made. It, it extends that far. But it doesn't seem to be the case for Calvin, though. For Calvin, the middle knowledge um, logically comes after the creative decree, but not for Melina. For Melina, God just has that from all eternity. He, God, know, God has exhaustive knowledge of creaturely freedom um, from all eternity. And that includes worlds that are potential and will never be actual. Human beings that will never become actual. Molina thinks that God's omniscience extends that. (coughs) Okay, go ahead there, Sean. Uh, During your um, description of Neoplatonism, I believe it was, you said that uh, God kind of, although he is completely good, that evil can come about from it. Would that be somewhat like a double double destination or something? I'm not sure. I need to think about it. Somehow he is strongly actualizing evil in the world, but because 
we're just supposed to believe that this ultimate reality is all good so that when, when this reality predetermines that people are going to suffer in Hades, it's good. Somehow it's good. It's, this, right. it's, a, it's a divine play that's all good. There's a theory out about double determination and how yeah. it's positive, positive, and positive, and negative. Oh. Uh, all in terms of the elect only. Yeah. Uh, it's positive for the elect. It's being a negative thing for the people that aren't, but it's, it's made all of those the elect. I see. Yeah, I think I need to meditate more on that okay. before I could say anything <laughs> more. Yeah. Okay, so thank God the introduction, introduction stuff is over. We can talk more about this anytime, but next week we're going to be in the Bible exclusively, and we're going to stay there until the end of the course, okay? I'll close us off with a word of prayer, and then we're done. Our loving God and Father, we just want to thank you for being here with us today and helping us plow through this hard, hard material, this hard introductory material but um, it does put things into perspective for us. It's kind of important that we, that we know this, these things. But uh, Lord, next week we want to open your holy book, your sacred library, and we pray that you'd be here with us in a special way when we do that. And uh, Lord, through the week, when we do our private devotional times, we pray that you'd be pleased to open the Bible to us and open our hearts to the Bible. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you loved us first, and we ask you to bless, protect, encourage, and provide for your people in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, praise God. Pastor John.